All right, everyone, I think we're going to get underway. Hello again, my name is Bruce Celery, and I am the president of the Canadian Club of Toronto. Thank you so much for joining us today, and I hope you enjoyed in particular the charcuterie board, which was a whole taste sensation. Thank you, Mitchell. I'd also like to welcome our youth and young leaders who are here from Ryerson's Food and Nutrition Program, supported by the Canadian Club of Toronto. Where are you? Where are the Ryerson folks? Big wave. Hello. Welcome. Thank you for being here. You are our future, so thank you in advance. Uh, we are also grateful to our sponsor, CG Canaccord Judy Wealth Management, Pinkowski Group, represented today by Carrie Pinkowski. Thank you very much for your sponsorship, Carrie. We appreciate it. And to the very good Bushers for providing that charcuterie today. A little round of applause for them as well. Beautiful. Plant-based protein is having a moment. It's a big moment. Celebrities have been on this for years, but this January, this past January, in case you didn't see it, uh, the Golden Globe Awards meal was entirely vegan. There is also a website called Vegan Disney World that covers the many, many options on offer at those theme parks. And if you don't happen to be Leonardo DiCaprio or Mickey Mouse, it is helpful to know that uh, a and Restaurants has a whole selection of things that they're, they're rolling out, including the Beyond Meat Burger. So what is next? How big will this market get? Is the appetite for passion fruit carpaccio and jackfruit stew sustainable? And how are Canadian companies positioned to profit from all this growth? Today, our panelists are going to answer these questions and many more. Let me introduce the panel. Dr. Sylvain Charlebois is a professor in food distribution and policy at uh, Dalhousie University in Halifax. He is also the scientific director of the Agri-Food Analytics Lab there. And before Dal, he was affiliated with the University of Guelph's Errol Food Institute, in which he co-founded. Known as the Food Professor, his research focuses on food distribution, security, and safety. And Sylvain, when I first read that, it read to me like food processor instead of food professor, so I'm going to endeavor to have it be correct. You could. Candace Hutchings is the author of the cookbook, The Edgy Veg, 138 carnivore-approved vegan recipes. She delivers vegan recipes with attitude and more than a touch of comedy. Edgy by nature, both her popular YouTube channel and Instagram pages has disrupted the vegan community with her candid and humorous take on activism. Perry Pinkowski, Pinkowski is the Portfolio Manager and Investment Advisor at Canaccord Genuity Wealth Management. He has over 25 years of experience with North American and European capital markets. A leader and innovator in the Canadian equity arena, Kerry prides himself as an early adopter on major investment trends, including that old thing called the internet, gold, energy, cannabis, and now food technology. Johan Turgesen is a 20-year veteran of the plant-based food industry. He co-founded Burkhan Nutriscience Corporation in 1999 and has helped establish Merit Functional Foods, which is building the world's first commercial canola protein production facility. He also has a lifelong passion for the environment and a deep knowledge of the plant-based food economy. Moderating today's conversation is Susan Krasinski Robertson. She covers the uh, retail industry for Report on Business at the Globe and Mail. She's worked as a freelance reporter and contributed to the Ottawa Citizen, the Montreal Gazette, as well as CBC Radio's Dispatches and Search Engine. Susan and panelists, I am pleased, very pleased to turn the Canadian Club of Toronto podium over to you. Thank you. Thanks for joining us, everyone. So as Bruce mentioned in the introduction, this is a, a space where it feels like we can't go a day without some news breaking. So there was the Starbucks news yesterday, which came out of their sustainability announcement last month, where they said they were going to invest more in plant-based menu items. So Canada is the first place where we're seeing that start to move. Today, we saw Wendy's announce that they've actually developed their own plant-based burger. They've developed that in-house, which is a different approach than other quick service restaurant chains, which have invested in either Impossible Foods Burger or Beyond Meats Burger, primarily. We've seen a lot of movement. We've seen the Disney announcement uh, announcing Impossible Foods as their preferred plant-based meat provider. So there's a lot of movement in this space right now. It makes it a very timely moment to have this conversation. I thought before we got started, that was a great introduction. But I also wanted to give the audience a bit more of a sense of our panelists' experience in this space. So I'm wondering if we can start out, if you can tell us a little bit about how long you have all been watching 
the plant-based space or involved in or invested in the plant-based space, and a little bit about your history with this topic. You want to go first? Sure, sure. Um, my, um, my background started in this space in uh, 2014, so I've attended uh, TED Global in Vancouver since that time, and uh, there's a lot of leaders from Silicon Valley that come up to Vancouver, and uh, they're really on the forefront, really, of investing. And they invited me to the uh, Obvious Ventures uh, party January 2015, and met a number of the players, and they were backing Miyoko Cheese, the same group with the second largest investors in Beyond Meat. And for me, it was like a curiosity, like what, this group typically invests in social media companies, tech companies, but all of a sudden they're in food tech, and this is five years ago, so I, I've been following it ever since and watching their investments uh, the whole way, so it's not, uh, not a fad or it's not a, a couple month thing here, so. Hmm. Yeah, I've been doing research uh, in, in agri-food uh, for 20 years. Um, so I've looked at proteins for 20 years, uh, but really, to be honest, I've only looked at plant-based proteins for perhaps maybe five years. Uh, so I look at this plant-based phenomena, as Bruce said, uh, but also look at how, um, where this disruption is coming from. And, and let's be honest, it's coming from the outside of ag. A lot of it comes from outside of ag, Silicon Valley and so on, which is actually not a bad thing. So I look at that phenomena, but I also look in the inside of ag and look at how stakeholders that we all know feel threatened, really threatened by what's going on. And uh, it's, they're scared, absolutely. Hey guys, I'm Candice. Um, I've been vegan for about 10 years and just kind of fell into this as a career. Uh, 10 years ago when I went vegan, we didn't have such a global conversation about plant-based proteins or plant-based meats. So I started my career by actually creating uh, family favorite recipes, recipes I grew up with um, that we didn't have on the market. I mean, we didn't have, you know, really silk or Beyond Meat, any of this stuff available. So you had to make everything from home. So that's what I do now. I have a YouTube channel and a blog where I teach people how to make their favorite recipes, just a plant-based option. I kind of cater to the reducitarian, the flexitarian, if you will, not just the vegan community, to just, you know, kind of encourage everyone to reduce their um, their carbon footprint by choosing a plant-based option. And uh, I'm Johan. I'm a CEO of Burkhan Nutri-Science, and have been in this industry, I guess, over 20 years now. Uh, we started 21 years ago uh, with a technology uh, that was uh, unproven at the time to extract protein from canola meal. That was our single and sole purpose at the time. We were very naive, didn't know really, to be honest, what we were getting into. Uh, and it, uh, what has happened is that there have been a couple of trends that have uh, carried us forward. Uh, first was the health and wellness trend, and then most recently there's been really an incredible surge in interest in plant-based protein. Uh, I don't have a scientific background, but 20 years now spent in a company doing um, science technology with respect to essentially the chemistry of food. I feel like now I have a PhD in the space. <laughs> Candice, I want to start with you uh, with a question. Um, so you were talking about marketing this to everybody. Um, and so you're, you're vegan yourself, but you are really marketing plant-based menu options to flexitarians to the mass market. How does that change your approach as a cookbook author and a chef? Um, well, I really try to have conversations with these people. Um, I mean, the vegans, the vegans and the vegetarians, I've ar I already have them. Mm -hmm. You know, they don't need to be marketed to. They don't need to be preached to. Um, but neither does anyone else. Um, I think if you just approach it, I always say that my activism is led with a fork. So just, you know, kind of tying into those nostalgic foods um, and really like get the, get the glands salivating, if you will, showing that you can still have you know, mac and cheese and lasagna um, just with a plant-based option that's just as delicious and you know, probably will make you feel better and whether it's you know, you know, in your tummy or also make you feel better because you're doing something great for the environment or your health. Um, so I, I, I would say my main audience, which is I, what I think with a lot of these um, fast food chains that are coming out with a plant-based burger, it's not really for the vegans or the vegetarians, it's more for the person that's curious. I call them veg curious people. Um, that just wanna feel good about something or you know, maybe they didn't really like meat growing up and they didn't know that there was another option. Or they're aware of some of the issues that have come out around exactly. sustainability and health. I mean, well. that's that's the huge conversation now. Is a lot of people aren't turning because they 
a lot of the time isn't because of the animals that they're choosing a plant-based life. It's because they want to make a global impact and they're very aware of uh, climate change, global warming, and, and they want to do something. Um, and sometimes, you know, it is easy just to do it with the food that you eat because it's such a huge industry and we make such an impact that way. It's so interesting because you're in such glitzy company as we were talking about before. I mean, Bruce mentioned the Golden Globes. I was talking about how Natalie Portman was on the Oscars red carpet talking about if you could just reduce the amount of meat meals you eat every week. So this is really something that's coming into the pop culture conversation too. And Johan, I actually wanted to ask you about that because we were talking about the pricing of the Beyond Meat IPO and how some of, the, some of what was missed there might have been the appeal of these products to non-strict vegetarians and yeah. vegans. Yeah, you know, what I would say, the, the, the following on that point, what I would say is that it's also uh, stratified. It depends actually on whether you're talking about boomers or Gen X, Y, Z, or millennials, et cetera. I've seen some really high quality research by one of the largest food and beverage companies in the world where they were presenting to us. And what they were showing is that if you were to ask uh, a baby boomer why they would consider the product, they're probably gonna cite health reasons. But if you ask kids who are uh, my children's age, they're all university age, it's much more gonna have to do with climate. But, and or animal welfare issues, et cetera. And maybe only secondly, uh, health and wellness issues. Hmm. And, and I say that in part, uh, one of the questions that quite often gets pointed at me, people will say, well, hey, uh, you know, the products that your proteins are going to go into, they're, they're no healthier than beef. And then my response to them is, yeah, but there's so many consumers out there who would say, you mean I can eat a product that's just as healthy as beef, but save the planet and have the, uh, the, the, the feel good about the fact that no animals were involved in the production. So it's, 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 a, it's an interesting market and one that's complex and hard to understand where these trends are coming from, but they're coming fast. It is fascinating, too, because the health aspect is something that's been a bit of a controversial talking point, right? The, the main criticism of a, a lot of these plant-based foods has been, but they're extremely heavily processed, which is true. Right. Right? It is true. And we all should be attempting to eat fewer heavily processed foods. So I want to throw that up into the group. What do we think that, that impact of the, the processed food conversation could have on the adoption of these kinds of foods? I mean, if you're eating processed food anyway, what's the difference if you're eating it processed from an animal or processed and plant-based? I mean, you, you can't really compare, let's say, let's go with Beyond Meat, for example. You can't compare a Beyond Meat burger to, let's say, a salad. They're two, they're literally apples and oranges. Like, yeah. they're not the same thing. So that argument, I think, sometimes comes just from a place of defensiveness. Um, just, oh, this is different. And, and many of us are, I'm adverse to change a lot of the time. Um, so you can't really compare the two. But if you compare it to an actual burger, I mean, then you have, it, it's just as processed as any other burger that you're going to get at any other fast food chain. Mm -hmm. If, if I could respond, oh, sorry, go ahead. I'll go ahead. Uh, you what want. I was going to say is, is this, is that uh, I, I had a conversation recently. In fact, I think we were, it was at a cocktail function at the Four Seasons, and then someone was saying to me that very thing, oh, but these foods are, are highly processed. Well, that's easy to say if, in fact, you're so wealthy that all your food at home is fresh fruits and vegetables, et cetera, and you have the time, et cetera, to deal with it. But in fact, the food industry has to be able to supply food that sits on store shelves, that is in trucks, et cetera, that people can grab and go. And in fact, the, the products that are processed the way we're processing them allow for a lot longer shelf life. Have you looked at what the shelf life is of oat milk? It's way longer than it is for cow's milk. And so a lot of these things actually have the promise of being better for for, I don't want to say the average consumer, but many, many, many more consumers. And it's a little bit, it's a little bit snobby to say, oh, it's too processed. You know, I like only fresh berries in the morning. Well, that's fine if you can afford that, but you know, look at the 29 million people who live in Beijing. You can't have every one of them eating you know, uh, uh, freshly delivered uh, fruits and vegetables every single day. It's, it's unrealistic. I, I'm going to piggyback on that. I always say to people, processed food, uh, GMO food, it feeds the world. It, you can definitely cater to a larger audience. You can get to those countries that you know, don't have access to the fresh fruits and vegetables that we do. So I think it's, yeah. it's when you're having that conversation, you can't just turn your nose up at processed food. There is a time and a place for it, for sure. Yeah. And I think there is quite a market, too, for artisanal food, like lower processed plant-based foods, mm -hmm. and on what uh, Very Good uh, Butchers is doing. So mm -hmm. it's expanding uh, rapidly. Mm -hmm. So then you had a thought on that, too. I have a lot of thoughts, actually. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this is what I think. Uh, I, I think we're paying for Beyond Meat's legacy. Um, 
First of all, Beyond Meat should have been Canadian, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. Uh, we missed out on this one, on that one. So kudos to Beyond Meat. They actually proven to the world that plant-based manufacturing is scalable. They, they did that less than a year ago. So we can thank them for that. The problem with their strategy, and I've always been concerned about that strategy, which leads to the conversation we're having today, all the confusion we have over health benefits, the environment, and all that, it's because of this infatuation of comparing the Miami product with beef. Yeah. As, as much as it's been going on for 11 years since they started in 2008, 2010. So we're paying for that right now. Yeah. So a lot of people out there are saying, well, it's healthier. Well, a steak is a steak. It's on process. What's unhealthy about that? Well, look, and in, on the environment, if you want to see confusion on the environment, whenever someone says, oh, plant-based is more, is more environmentally friendly, where's the evidence? I can find tons of studies proving your point, but I can also find a tons of studies proving another kind of point. So there's, there's and that's unfortunate because there's a lot of confu confusion out there right now. Absolutely. We also were talking about the, the boomers and the millennials. I think the, the instinct would be that the millennials are driving most of the growth of this. But is that accurate, or is that just a stereotype that it's the younger consumers who are the ones driving? On the investment side, for sure. Yeah? Yeah. Like, I'm a big believer in uh, following what millennials like to invest into. Mm -hmm. and, and actually, prior to millennials, you look at, like, Amazon.com 20 years ago, people were fighting that trend. Like, most analysts were negative on that. You look at Tesla five years ago. Um, my wife and I, we, we love Teslas. We were probably too early in that, in the stock, right? Mm -hmm. But um, it was all retail driven. And with the whole Beyond Meat moving from $25 to 240 that was younger investors who, uh, who loved the story, loved the, uh, loved the space, so. Yeah. It, 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 the Beyond Meat one is really interesting if you consider this. The, uh, the investment banks that were involved in that, if I'm not mistaken, it was uh, Chase, uh, it was JP. It was uh, JP Morgan was one of the two that led it, and was it Goldman? I think the other. These are two of the biggest, best investment banks in the world. They priced it at twenty five thousand, at twenty five dollars, and thought they were heroes, and they were so wrong. Mm -hmm. And I think that they were wrong because what they didn't understand, and I think the investors get it, is that people really want to feel better about their decision. They want to feel better, A, about their uh, food decision, but they also want to feel better about their investment, investment decision. decision. Mm -hmm. And that's what they missed. Hmm. And, I think I, and, and, and they're still missing it. I that's think. where the millennials come in is that, I mean, I'm one, and I think about every purchase that I make. I think about yeah. how, I mean, when you, you have to look at it from a larger scale, right? So it's not just, okay, I'm buying this thing. How is that dollar that I'm spending impacting not only myself, but the environment. And, and I think we like to invest in things that make us feel good and make us feel like we have a purpose. Um, as millennials, I think a lot of us can get lost in, in the whole narrative of like, oh, we can't afford a house and blah, 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 yeah. and avocado toast. <laughs> but um, <laughs> we like to, we we like to feel like we better. have a purpose. We like to feel like we're here on this universe to make a change. And I think that that's where a lot of this is coming from as well. The more you give choice to consumers, the more you can um, create social bridges between clusters in the marketplace. And so as soon as you got Beyond Meat out there, and, and I mentor startups in, in, in the plant-based space, and you actually allow people to dine together, stay together, because before, I mean, nobody was really talking to each other. Mm -hmm. uh, so yes, the, the younger generations, I agree, that absolutely, they're, they're really more influence and they're buying more of these products but I've also uh, we've also noticed that kids children of X's Xers or boomers are influencing the older generation as well with this Absolutely. new agenda and they weren't exposed to that before mm -hmm. and they're they're they if they want their kid to go home and eat with them well they got to make some changes so, Adapt yeah. or have a big fight exactly. at the dinner table. Right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, and that's where um, what I do with my business is I do a lot of consulting for restaurants. And so I'll come in and I'll look at their menu and I'm like, okay, if you have six people that want to come eat at your restaurant right. or go out to eat and two of them are vegan or vegetarian, you lose that, business. You lose yes. that entire table because yes. you don't have an option that is either A, there's either no option, yeah. or B, 
um, you don't have an option that's exciting for that person. Yeah. So I go in and I really analyze those menus. And I think that that's, again, like I said, adapt or die, right? Yeah. <laughs> like, do you want to lose an entire group of people just because you are resistant to a change that is so disruptive right now? It just doesn't make sense. Yeah. And it's funny, we were talking about the slow-moving in investment community, um, but Carrie, th there are also some some s normally slow-moving food companies that are starting to move on this, right? Mm -hmm. Cargill coming after Impossible and, and Beyond pretty hard, for and example. And go back to te like the Tesla example, yeah. I think they might have learned their lesson because like you saw Mercedes-Benz and BMW, they all thought they were gonna take on Tesla yeah. by coming out with hybrid cars yeah. with you know, classical combustible engines in there. And they all lost, you know, they, they, they rested too much on their laurels where I think the food industry, the car girls are going, okay, we're not going to lose this battle. So they're coming in pretty aggressive here. Mm -hmm. yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. We, we have a question from the audience. Actually, the generational question was one of them. Uh, but this is another one. Is there a conscious choice about pricing plant-based products as at or above the prices of their meat counterparts? If I, I'm, I'm concerned about that. It's a good I don't know who asked the question, but it's a good Great one question. because the, the economics of plant-based dieting at retail don't make sense to me right now. Uh, they're priced all over the place. They're placed all over the place in the grocery store. You have no idea where to find them. Mm -hmm. uh, it is confusing the, cu the customer looking for that product. It, it's hard work right now. And once you get to that product, like $8 for two patties. And, yeah, yeah. and technically, it should be the opposite. So I'm very happy of, of what's going on in Winnipeg, with the, which I call the epicenter of, of protein manufacturing now in Canada, with all the investments, because we're going to need those investments to, keep, to bring that price down. Just to be clear, we don't want the price to go down. <laughs> <laughs> margins, <laughs> margins. <laughs> Which is why yeah. if I ask for soy milk at Starbucks, for example, I'm getting charged 60 cents more, right? Yeah. Like that's, but you want it, to it democratize makes, it turns choices. People off. You want to make sure that everyone can afford exactly. plant-based yeah. product. Yeah. And I mean, as uh, you and I were talking about this over coffee, that you know, the true price of food is a whole other discussion. And you know, what we actually should be paying for food in terms of what it costs to produce it ethically and sustainably, is a, that's a whole other Well, and with subsidies, like other Candace was saying, <laughs> um, the cost that we see uh, or the price that we see of dairy is not the true price of dairy because of the subsidies, for example. Mm -hmm. Right. Got another question from the audience. What will be the biggest plant-based food trend? Or I'm going to expand this question slightly to say non-meat-based food trend, because I know it's not always plant-based, uh, coming up in the next year or two. Lab-grown meat? Yeah. I'm, I'm a I think it's Talk to be, us uh, about what that is. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think it's going to be a real game changer over the next uh, two to five years. There's, there's a number of companies that say they're going to come to market in the next year. And if they do, it'll be 1% cultivated meat and 99% plant-based, but they can come to market and say we're first. Can we actually define what we mean by lab-grown meat? What it is, uh, there's a company called Mosa Meats out of Holland that uh, created the world's first, uh, um, call it hamburger, in 2013. And Sergey Brin was a initial found, or financier of that. So what it is, you can create uh, the muscle, the fiber, the fat, put it all together, and really it it's comes down to cost. So that, that burger costs a quarter million dollars, and the, the, the biggest driver for it is growth media. So growth media last year is about $400 a liter. Supposedly they're getting it down to about $40 a liter, but we need it to go down to about a dollar a liter. But once, once it's, we get it down to that cost, it's actually cleaner than real cow meat. It can last longer. There's no antibiotics in there. So I think that's going to be a, a real game changer. And also, you can do it for dairy right now, too. Hmm. Mm. Interesting. The, the regulatory framework for, for that mm -hmm. is going to be complicated in Canada, uh, given, given the heritage, given the baggage on the animal side. I got to tell you, this is going to be a battle. It'll uh, be yeah. Canada's loss, though, because... Oh, I'm not because saying it's the, not a loss. The, yeah, because the Europeans or Singapore's got a real strong government initiative there. But, but dairy in Canada, yeah. okay, is sacred. And they, they're not going to go 
out quietly. Not just sacred, but you talk about lobbying a well-financed This is advocacy. the advantage that Americans have. I mean, Americans can actually innovate, innovate, innovate. We don't, in ag, we don't understand what innovation means. That's why I love seeing capital outside of ag going into ag yeah. to actually innovate. I would respond to that same question slightly different. So on the question of what's the next big innovation, I would say in the nearer term, I totally agree on the cell-based need, it's coming. But in the nearer term, what I believe you're gonna see is that in the same way that, that Beyond Meat and Impossible Meat sort of crack the code of being able to make a, 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 a veggie burger taste much, much better and, and actually respond the way you expect it to grill and, and flame up when you press on it and, and really essentially mimic it. I think we're going to see the same thing in the plant-based cheeses, in the plant-based ice creams, in the plant-based yogurts, etc. I'm not saying that what's out there right now isn't good. In some cases they are. In some cases they're actually quite disappointing. But I think that there is yet to come some real leaps and bounds in those products. And I, I say that with a level of confidence because I know that our company and other companies are working with major food and beverage companies, uh, and, they, and they really want to push the envelope and make these products better. And they understand that in the end, the consumer is the king, and the consumer wants it to taste really good. Taste really good and be very pleasant. But it doesn't mean, if it tastes good, doesn't mean that it tastes like something else that already no, exists. Fair enough, fair enough. It's, it's, it's this, though. In the same way that five years ago, a plant-based a veggie burger was a disappointment, typically, when you would barbecue yeah. one yourself and eat it, in the same way that that game has been brought up, I'm just saying that the, the level of the quality of the products, so that people actually say, hey, have you tried? In the same way they're doing with the veggie burgers now, I'm expecting that to be the case for veggie-based yogurt, cheese, et cetera. Yeah, I think cheese, there's so much room for growth there, and it is the one major barrier that I constantly hear from people that are like, I'm vegetarian, but yeah. not vegan because cheese. Because cheese, yeah. yeah. And I think that there's so much room for growth there because, I mean, there's a couple that are like, okay, yeah, it's okay, or it's decent, or I haven't had cheese in 10 years, so like, yeah, yeah. sure. Sure, whatever. Yeah. But for a cheese eater, it's just not there, and yeah. somebody yeah. needs to crack that code. The to answer the question about uh, what's going to be the biggest change or trend, trend. yeah, I'm, I'm looking at Farmgate a lot more, and I think gene editing is going to be a big, big one, uh, which will make uh, Paul's growing, everything we grow out in fields much more efficient. Uh, yeah. And gene editing is basically just playing around with, with coding. It's not GMOs. It's just gene editing. It's a slight version of it. Hasn't it been approved yet in Canada, but it's coming. But the caveat well, you just did that? there. Like CRISPR-Cas9? It's coming. I, that's what I heard. The caveat you just did there, Silvermine, is so interesting I heard to it. me. Because <laughs> I think what you're talking about there is like, you're like, well, it's not GMOs. And I think the reason but you have to you give that caveat is there's so much skepticism around whether food science has always brought good things to consumers, right? And does, does this trend have to fight against that a little bit? But, so to not suffer from what has happened with GMO and the Franken food thing, yeah. uh, transparency is, is a must. And there's, I don't think there's enough of it. And, yeah. and that's yeah. why a lot of people were surprised that Beyond Meat had 27 ingredients and it was ultra processed. And all of a sudden, oh my god, is this this good? It's not so good. Transparency has to start now. But farmers will grow things they can ma make money with. If you don't have a product out in the field, you won't have a product on plates. Mm -hmm. For sure. And farmers are big believers, like you said, in making money. And um, oh, yeah. you know, if they could produce GM crops or gene edited crops, like not one person has ever died from a GM process, but it's a, mar it's a marketing thing. And we're, really everyone's does. scared of it because mm -hmm. we never told, or we've never been transparent about it, and we're paying for it. What market share do you see? This is a question from the audience again. What market share do you see for plant-based proteins in five to 10 years? The numbers that uh, we're looking at, the, the, the global meat and dairy industry is 1.7 uh, trillion. Mm -hmm. and we feel it could capture 10%. And if you look at plant-based milks, it's probably about 13%. So um, that's a $170 billion potential industry. And if you just look at the cannabis market, you know, the bubble that just popped, but that, that's going to be a 70 billion by 2027. So this could be more than twice the size. One stat from us at the lab, we expect that 16.5 million Canadians uh, will have decided to either reduce the amount of meat they consume or yeah. eliminate meat from their diets by 2025. That's the number we yeah. have. That said, Carrie, you mentioned- That's a lot of people. That's a lot of people. Yeah. That's, a lot of Canadian, that's a lot of Canada right yep. there. Carrie, you mentioned a bubble. So when I, people when talk I hear- People about this. Sorry. When I, I hear yeah. a fat, when someone say, oh, it's just a yeah. fat. 
I mean, they're not looking at our numbers. So fad is one, is one attack, bubble is another. People you, ask whether this is an investment bubble. You can't have a bubble with two companies. Like really, it's BYD. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, BYD, that the public mm -hmm. can invest to, into Burakon. Uh, impossible, will probably go public the next few years. I'm sure there'll be some cultivated companies, but it's, it hasn't even started. Mm -hmm. While we're on the investor questions, uh, another one from the audience. As a first time investor in the space, what's the best way to get exposure to plant-based innovation in my portfolio? The problem is there's a lack of, of companies. There's a real lack of supply, mm -hmm. but I'm, I'm pretty sure in the next 12, 24 months, there'll be a lot more um, going public. Mm -hmm. What role, uh, one more from the audience, what role do you see for the alignment of subsidies and policies that recognize the cost of negative environmental externalities with respect to planetary and human health. I've been an economist asking that <laughs> yeah. question. Uh, I, don't, I could feel that. Yeah. yeah. I mean, uh, for decades, we've known that there's these what economists call like externalities when some industry or some individual is producing a product that's at an expense to the society, but not direct expense to the company. And so this is absolutely an industry that is going to benefit from that. Because if you want to talk about what the cost is of, of beef production, my family is farmers back in Manitoba, and we had cattle. And I know that where the cattle were, no grass grew. You know what I mean? Like, I understood that there was a little too much of the, you know, uh, the chemicals that were in the cow's urine, et cetera. It, it, it is simply the case that this is, in fact, capturing one of those economics, where it's basically saying, if you have an industry, whether it's plastics, single-use plastics, or in this case, uh, a, a, an overuse of fertilizers or pesticides, et cetera, that's not being borne by the company, but that's being borne by the world, by the climate, and all of us in general, then there has to be some kind of mechanism to take that into account. And then that would show that, in fact, the price of beef is way higher than it currently is showing to be. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how we'll get to the answer. And it would be, uh, you know, it's a politically tough one to, to put forward. It's like carbon tax, but we're going to have to recognize it sometime. Do you know why the government gave $1.8 billion to dairy farmers last fall? Politics. Yeah. So I have one question. If, if we want to make this, you know, a political issue, Who's the spokesperson for plant-based? Good luck. Yeah. With dairy, dairy farmers, it's the dairy farmers of Canada, and they have more power than anyone in agri-food right now, and that's going to last for a while. They got $1.8 billion they don't need, they do not need. Vegans are paying for that $1.8 billion. Vegans believe dairy farming should be outlawed. This is what's going on in this country right now. I'm really hoping that the whole conversation with climate change and, and you know, the, the general citizen turning to their local politician to kind of push for different um, policies, I, I really hope that maybe that kind of takes some of that money and, and in, I don't know, inspires um, subsidies in other areas to make the world, you know, a greener place. But, I mean, those are rose-colored glasses, I think, right mm -hmm. now. <laughs> It's possible. It is possible. possible. Yeah, totally. yeah, we just have to be louder. We need more people in this room. That's what we need. Exactly. Yes. We've seen some, at retail, we've seen some ups and downs with testing out plant-based options. So we saw at Burger King, the Whopper, uh, the Impossible Whopper changed its price. We saw Tim Hortons introduce uh, Beyond Meat in its breakfast sandwiches and then pull it from restaurants. What does that tell you about the evolution of these products and the evolution of how retailers are managing the customer demand. I think right away it's poor ex execution. It, it's not yeah. people, I think they're seeing it as a trend and trying to hop on right away without really thinking through. Like why did Tim Hortons add burgers? With no grills. With no grills. Yeah. No one was going to Tim Hortons for a burger. So why would they go for a plant-based burger? And I think the execution in a lot of these is just done rather poorly. But they were going to Tim Hortons. They do go to Tim Hortons for breakfast sandwiches. Mm -hmm. So a Beyond Meat but sausage and a breakfast sandwich seemed like a, a it, closer fit with what people are going there but, for. But anyway. Tim Hortons is a warm it up place. That's what yeah. they do, right? Mm -hmm. the, I don't know if everybody knows, but all the donuts at Tim Hortons are delivered there frozen in a truck. <gasps> My God. <laughs> it's not a restaurant. Pearl clutching <laughs> moment. A place that warms them up, right? Yeah. And so I well, think they showed that, up at 2 o'clock in the morning. You just, you <laughs> just killed baking. it for me. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the, no, the, uh, the, I have a, again, I have a fairly strong opinion with respect to, you're seeing um, 
a, an awareness about the particular news stories that appear negative. But I could list for you lots and lots of news stories that are extremely positive on plant-based. The CEO of Nestle, which is the largest food and beverage company in the world, who Burkhan partnered with in the last month, uh, he was <laughs> out, uh, the CEO just last week in their, uh, in their quarterly uh, uh, financial uh, earnings call said that they are seeing double-digit growth accelerating, actually, in all of their plant-based products. They're, they're so excited about it, they see it as being their future. I could also point to, nobody knows this company, but there's a little baked goods shop in the UK. It's not little, it's actually publicly listed. It's there, Tim Hortons, and it's called Greg's. Mm -hmm. And Greg's, G-E-R-G-G -G, apostrophe S, makes a, uh, a, a, a vegan sausage that they put on the menu last January. And that was pre-IPO of Beyond Meat. So this isn't when people were focusing on it. This was them doing it really ahead of the curve, let's call it their own product. It sold so well that they actually reported it in their results as part of the reason why they exceeded the analysts' estimates for their earnings. So you I actually see Morgan tearing it apart. <laughs> well, even still, what I'm saying is the actual consumers are actually walking into the store in the morning and saying, "That's what I want," hmm. and buying it. And, and, and the sales are there. there and, there's yeah. no question. And here in Canada, you have Maple Leaf. Uh, Absolutely. investing in this space as well. You want yeah. to talk about giants who are, who actually, are getting you know, on board. Actually, Maple Leaf story is pretty good because they've not only invested $300 million in Indiana on a plant-based, uh, which should have been in Winnipeg, to be honest. Yeah. But anyways, <laughs> that's another story. Uh, they actually changed the governance of their company. I mean, the, the, the way Michael McCain structured Maple Leaf now is, is very much focused on protein. Mm -hmm. And I gotta tell you, I gotta give a lot of credit to Michael McCain because the board is very pro-animal protein. I don't know how he did it, but, and, and these are the things, investors, leaders in the business world, they, they, they can't avoid it. They see it, yeah. Money talks, the numbers talk, right? Mm -hmm. It's not that they're not there entirely, yeah. because in fact, Canada has uh, one of the super cluster programs is actually called Protein Industries Canada. Burkhan in particular benefited from that. Our joint venture subsidiary received like $9.2 million from that. It's a pittance compared to the 1.8 billion that they're apparently. And, and BIC has what, 19 projects funded so far? Yeah, yeah, so there yeah. is, there is, there is uh, funding. There, there's, there's, there's investment. Yeah. yeah. It's just, it's not as, I would say, visible. Uh, it's not as noisy, yeah. We have to wrap up, but I want to do a very, very quick lightning round before we do. Just a real quick one, if you can do it in as few words as possible. So I was a vegetarian. I'm not anymore. I'm a flexitarian now. Um, <laughs> so, you know, very typical millennial adjacent person. Um, and, uh, <laughs> and when I was a vegetarian, I didn't find veggie dogs and veggie burgers all that disappointing. They were fine. Maybe it had to do with the fact that I didn't eat meat all that often. But, um, but what has actually changed? We've come to this space where all of a sudden we're all talking about plant-based foods. We've had plant-based protein alternatives for ages. What has gotten better? What has actually changed about these foods from a technology standpoint, from a man manufacturing standpoint? And how fast is it continuing to change and continuing to get better right now? I, I think number one is taste. It's, I think that stands, stands apart. And texture? Cause, yeah, because like 10, 15 years ago, this stuff was terrible. I think accessibility. It wasn't really accessible. I remember growing up, my mother was vegetarian, so we had like the worst veggie dogs. Like they were from a can, they were awful. Um, but she had to like go to like the local church and like buy them there. And this like <laughs> van that came <laughs> once a month, and now you can go to a normal grocery store and, you know, taste. 12 different types of veggie dogs? I'd say, I, I don't look at the supply side. I actually look at uh, demand like with social media. Everything's so uh, amplified with social media. I mean, consumers have a voice. And what they're asking is choice. I think that's what happened. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. And I would add, though, that I do believe that all of the really smart scientists and engineers, the food scientists, et cetera, they've been working on it for years, and there's so much capital at play right now, and, and, and so there are improvements being made, and products are getting better. Thank you all for lending us your perspective today. It's, what a fascinating conversation. Thank you all for joining us. That's a good job. That's good job. Good try. Cheers. Yeah. Sorry. Oh. <laughs> I want to have my dessert. I know, I know. <laughs>
Um, I just want to say thank you uh, very much uh, to everyone who joined us here today. Um, this is this this event is particularly uh, close to my heart. I have a bit of a bit of a uh, pet peeve. I'm a Gen Xer. Apparently, don't exist. There's boomers and there's millennials, but nobody in between. Um, and I was I'm was a vegetarian for many years, um, and then married an Italian who seems to eat um, salami every day. Uh, and this has always been a challenge in my family with the kids, and you know how do you impose and that those discussions. And then my son actually this summer came home and said, Mom, I want to be a pescatarian. And then um, uh, earlier this week I came home and my husband of his own avail went out and bought Beyond Beef burgers. So the world is changing and we represent uh, three different, demograph three different uh, demographics. So that really tells you, I think, where the world is going. And at the same time, I have to say, as a busy person, and I think this goes for a lot of us here, you know, you do want to do something good and when you don't have the time because you're working and you've got kids, if you feel that you can make a change just by the things you buy and how you behave on a day-to-day -day basis, it does make you feel good. So um, I really do. And actually how, doing this event personally makes me feel really good. And so good to see all you people out here. So I really want to thank everyone for coming out. And I really want to thank our panelists. Um, this was a fascinating discussion and I think really is... Uh, telling about where this very, very important um, industry is going. And um, I think real, a lot of food for thought. So thanks so much for your time and um, sharing your thoughts with us. And lastly, I just want to say um, a thanks to uh, the very good butchers for um, sharing what was delicious charcuterie. I know that I will be ordering some to my home in Toronto for my next uh, dinner party. So thank you very much. It was great. Um, and lastly, I would also like to thank MediaEvents.ca, Canada's online event space, and BBC for live streaming today's event. Thank you once again for joining us, and we'll see you all soon. Thank you.